Welcome to another episode of Mike Reads. Tonight we'll be continuing in our series on Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson with Chapter 15, which is entitled How the Price System Works. As I've mentioned throughout the course of this series, we are doing this series as a parallel read with Thomas Sowell's Economic uh, sorry, Economic Facts and Fallacies. So I'll put a link in this video's description to that series so you can follow along there as well. As I've also mentioned throughout the course of this series, at the end of each of these reads, we'll be doing an analysis and review um, of the read. So I'll put a timestamp in this video's description so you can jump straight to the analysis and review part of the video if that's how you'd like to go about things. Um, also, before we get started, the read's a little on the long side for Hazlitt, so Hazlitt has broken this read up into two parts. He's labeled them, as he's done in the past, uh, solely numerically and doesn't have a label for part one. So after I read the chapter title, I'll be inserting part one, um, and I'll be inserting the word part in front of two, because he has these uh, parts labeled, as I mentioned, purely numerically. So with that out of the way, let's dive into tonight's read which is Chapter 15, How the Price System Works. The whole argument of this book may be summed up in the statement that in studying the effects of any given economic proposal, we must trace not merely the immediate results, but the results in the long run, not merely the primary consequences, but the secondary consequences, and not merely the effects on some special group, but the effects on everyone. It follows that it is foolish and misleading to concentrate our attention merely on some special point, to examine, for example, merely what happens in one industry without considering what happens in all. But it is precisely from the persistent and lazy habit of thinking, uh, only of some particular industry or process in isolation, that the major fallacies of economics stem. These fallacies pervade not merely the arguments of the hired spokesmen of special interests, but the arguments even of some economists who pass as profound. It is on the fallacy of isolation at bottom that the quote-unquote production-free use and not profit school is based, with its attack on the allegedly vicious quote-unquote price system. The problem of production, say the adherents of this school, is solved. This resounding error, as we shall see, is also the starting point of most currency cranks and share the wealth charlatans. The, the scientists, the efficiency experts, the engineers, the technicians have solved it. They could turn out almost anything you care to mention in huge and practically unlimited amounts. But alas, the world is not ruled by engineers thinking only of production, but by the businessmen thinking only of profit. The businessmen give their orders to the engineers instead of vice versa. These businessmen will turn out any object as long as there is a profit in doing so. But the moment there is no longer a profit in making that article, the wicked businessmen will stop making it, though many people's wants are unsatisfied and the world is crying for more goods. There are so many fallacies in this view that they cannot all be disentangled at once. But the central error, as we have hinted, comes from looking at only one industry, or even at several industries in turn, as if each of them existed in isolation. Each of them, in fact, exists in relation to all the others, and every important decision made in it is affected by and affects the decisions made in all the others. We can understand this better if we understand the basic problem that business collectively has to solve. To simplify this as much as possible, let us consider the problem that confronts a Robinson Crusoe on his desert island. He wants at, his wants at first seem endless. He is soaked with rain, he shivers from cold, he suffers from hunger and thirst. He needs everything, drinking water, food, a roof over his head, protection from animals, a fire, a soft place to lie down. It is impossible for him to satisfy all these needs at once, he has not the time, energy, or resources. He must attend immediately to the most pressing need. He suffers most, say, from thirst. He hollows out a place in the sand to collect rainwater or build some crude receptacle. When he is provided for only a small water supply, however, he must turn to finding food before he tries to improve this. He can try to fish, but to do this he needs either a hook and line or a net and he must set to work on these. 
But everything he does delays or prevents him from doing something else only a little less urgent. He is faced constantly by the problem of alternative applications of his time and labor. A Swiss family Robinson, perhaps, finds this problem a little easier to solve. It has more mouths to feed, but it also has more hands to work for them. It can practice division and specialization of labor. The father hunts, the mother prepares the food, the children collect firewood. But even the family cannot afford to have one member of it doing endlessly the same thing, regardless of the relative urgency of the common need he supplies and the urgency of other needs still unfulfilled. When the children have gathered a certain pile of firewood, they cannot be used simply to increase the pile. It is soon time for one of them to be sent, say, for more water. The family, too, has a constant problem of choosing among alternative applications of labor and, if it is lucky enough to have acquired guns, fishing, tackle, a boat, axes, saws, and so on, of choosing among alternative applications of labor and capital. It would be considered unspeakably silly for the wood-gathering member of the family to complain that they could gather more firewood if his brother helped him all day instead of getting the fish that were needed for the family dinner. It is recognized clearly in the case of an isolated individual or family that one occupation can expand only at the expense of all other occupations. Elementary illustrations like this are sometimes ridiculed as quote-unquote Caruso economics. Unfortunately, they are ridiculed most by those who most need them, who fail to understand the particular principle illustrated even in this simple form, or who lose track of that principle completely when they come to examine the bewildering complications of a great modern economic society. Part 2 Let us now turn to such a society. How is the problem of alternative applications of labor and capital to meet thousands of different needs and wants of different urgencies solved in such a society? It is solved precisely through the price system. It is solved through the constantly changing interrelationships of costs of production, prices, and profits. Prices are fixed through the relationship of supply and demand, and in turn affect supply and demand. When people want more of an article, they offer more for it. The price goes up. This increases the profits of those who make the article. Because it is now more profitable to make that article than others, The people already in the business expand their production of it, and more people are attracted to the business. This increased supply then reduces the price and reduces the profit margin until the profit margin on that article once more falls to the general level of profits, relative risk considered, in other industries. Or the demand for that article may fall, or the supply of it may be increased to such a point that its price drops to a level where there is less profit in making it than in making other articles, or perhaps there is an actual loss in making it. In this case, the marginal producers, that is, the producers who are least efficient or whose costs of production are highest, will be driven out of business altogether. The product will now be made only by the more efficient producers who operate on lower costs. The supply of that commodity will also drop, or will at least cease to expand. This process is the origin of the belief that prices are determined by costs of production. The doctrine, stated in this form, is not true. Prices are determined by supply and demand, and demand is determined by how intensely people want a commodity and what they have to offer in exchange for it. It is true that supply is in part determined by costs of production. What a commodity has cost to produce in the past cannot determine its value. That will depend on the present relationship of supply and demand. But the expectations of businessmen concerning what a commodity will cost to produce in the future and what its future price will be will determine how much of it will be made. This will affect future supply. There is therefore a constant tendency for the price of a commodity and its marginal cost of production to equal each other, but not because that marginal cost of production directly determines the price. The private enterprise system, then, might be compared to thousands of machines, each regulated by its own quasi-automatic governor, yet with these machines and their governors all interconnected and influencing each other, 
so that they act in effect like one great machine. Most of us have noticed the automatic governor on a steam engine. It usually consists of two balls or weights which work by centrifugal force. As the speed of the engine increases, these balls fly away from the rod to which they are attached and so automatically narrow or close off a throttle valve which regulates the intake of steam and thus slows down the engine. If the engine goes too slowly, on the other hand, the balls drop, widen the throttle valve, and increase the engine's speed. Thus every departure from the desired speed itself sets in motion the forces that tend to correct that departure. It is precisely in this way that the relative supply of thousands of different commodities is regulated under the system of competitive price enterpri private enterprises. When people want more of a commodity, their competitive bidding raises its price. This increases the profits of the producers who make that product. This stimulates them to increase their production. It leads others to stop making some of the products they previously made and turn to making the product that offers them the better return. But this increases the supply of that commodity at the same time that it reduces the supply of some other commodities. The price of that product therefore falls in relation to the price of other products, and the stimulus to the relative increase in its production disappears. In the same way, if the demand falls off for some product, its price and the profit in making it go lower, and its production declines. It is this last development that scandalizes those who do not understand the quote-unquote price system they denounce. They accuse it of creating scarcity. Why, they ask indignantly, should manufacturers cut off the production of shoes at the point where it becomes unprofitable to produce any more? Why should they be guided merely by their own profits? Why should they be guided by the market? Why do they not produce shoes to the quote-unquote full capacity of modern technical processes? The price system in private enterprise conclude the quote-unquote production for use philosophers are merely a form of quote-unquote scarcity economics. These questions and conclusions stem from the fallacy of looking at one industry in isolation, of looking at the tree and ignoring the forest. Up to a certain point, it is necessary to produce shoes, but it is also necessary to produce coats, shirts, trousers, homes, plows, shovels, factories, bridges, milk, and bread. It would be idiotic to go on piling up mountains of surplus shoes simply because we could do it, while hundreds of more urgent needs were unfulfilled. Now in an economy in equilibrium, a given industry can expand only at the expense of other industries. For at any moment, the factors of production are limited. One industry can be expanded only by diverting it to labor, to its labor, land, and capital that would otherwise be employed in other industries. And when a given industry shrinks or stops expanding its output, it does not necessarily mean that there has been any net decline in aggregate production. The shrinkage at that point may have merely released labor and capital to permit the expansion of other industries. It is erroneous to conclude, therefore, that a shrinkage of production in one line necessarily means a shrinkage in total production. Everything, in short, is produced at the expense of forgoing something else. Costs of production themselves, in fact, might be defined as the things that are given up, the leisure and pleasures, the raw materials with alternative potential uses, in order to create the thing that is made. It follows that it is just as essential for the health of a dynamic economy that dying industry should be allowed to die as that growing industry should be allowed to grow. For the dying industry absorb for the dying industries absorb labor and capital that should be released for the growing industries. It is only the much vilified price system that solves the enormously complicated problem of deciding precisely how much of tens of thousands of different commodities and services should be produced in relation to each other. These otherwise bewildering equations are solved quasi-automatically by the system of prices, profits, and costs. They are solved by this system incomparably better than any group of bureaucrats could solve them for they are solved by a system under which each consumer makes his own demand and casts a fresh vote, or a dozen fresh votes, every day, 
whereas bureaucrats would try to solve it by having made for the consumers not what the consumers themselves wanted, but what the bureaucrats decided was good for them. Yet though the bureaucrats do not understand the quasi automatic system of the market, they are always disturbed by it. They are always trying to improve it or correct it, usually in the interests of some wailing pressure group. What some of the results of their intervention are, we shall examine in succeeding chapters. Okay, that concludes the read. Now on to the analysis and review part of the video. All right, welcome to the analysis and review part of the video. So this is going to be kind of a short review because this chapter really is nothing more than a primer for a series on uh, prices that he goes through, that Hazlitt goes through in, over the course of the next few chapters. So just as a brief um, brief mention, because he only mentions this kind of as an aside, uh, what are prices? Well, prices are nothing more than an indicator or marker on which to build a response system. So when you have a when you have a market that is responsive to market influences, the way that it responds to those market influences is through certain markers and indicators, and the most effective of those markers and indicators are prices. Uh, and then as a result, um, it's not fair to say that prices are purely some sort of element of greed or anything like that. They are just markers, just indicators as to how to respond to market influences. Um, and all of this comes basically as an extension of Smith's lesson, which I, I think we'll be getting into in just a moment here. But and as far as how we know how to direct re scarce resources, um, the price system is the way to go about this. And Hazlitt explains this on page 108. It is only the much vilified price system that solves the enormously complicated problem of deciding pre precisely how much of tens of thousands of different commodities and services should be produced in relation to each other. So what a price allows you to do is to determine where the greatest, say, profitability might be, and that's really the only place where cost of goods sold or the cost of production factors into this equation because prices are actually set by the laws of supply and the laws of the law of supply and the law of demand. Uh, an equilibrium price is where the supply uh, curve meets the demand curve. And I went over this a little bit in a video I did on my other channel, so I'll link to that in this video's description if you guys want to get into that. How's it going to get more into the in depth into this conversation in the, in the following chapters? So we're going to kind of leave leave it at that. But what prices do as an indicator is allow businessmen who make these business decisions to determine where to allocate their scarce resources. And in this case, it's not just the scarce resources, but to, to allocate their time, their effort, their money, um, which includes, of course, some scarce resources. But what that allows us to do is to determine where there is the greatest profitability. And of course, in this case, profit really is nothing more than another indicator because it comes from price, which is an indicator. From a known, it's the difference between a known, which is the cost of goods sold, and the indicator. Uh, so in this case, it just acts as another indicator. And what we know from Smith's lesson is that when you have you, you have a truly mutually consensual transaction, both parties benefit. And the of course, you can't be conducting an infinite number of transactions at any given time. So you're going to be focusing on those transactions where, as I mentioned in that, that my series on interference, which I'll link to in this video's description, when you when you go from here to here because of a transaction versus from here to here as a result of a transaction, you're going to be engaging in much more of those transactions, which means that as a consumer, if you're way more willing to buy a product, um, then that's the product you really want to be spending your money on. So that's why the price for that product, that's why your demand for that product would reflect a much large, much higher price. As such, if I'm a producer and the profit margin, which is a reflection of the price in relation to the, to the cost of manufacturing or producing the good or service, if that profit margin is really large, what that means, <clears throat> what that really could only mean is that the benefit to the consumer is so much and the benefit to me is so much that it's worth having these goods. And that's where I'm going to be focusing my energy. So when this, in this case, what profit really is, is just saying those goods for which there is the greatest degree of profit are not only the goods that we are most willing to consume as consumers because of the high price relative to other things, but it's also the, the place where there is the greatest opportunity for actually manufacturing these, pro these, um, 
these goods or services. So in this case, high profits just is an indicator of high, high improvement of everyone's condition as, uh, on the whole, right? which is, of course, the entire lesson of this book is to look at things on the whole rather than in isolation. Um, he further answers, so the question of how else would we know how to direct scarce resources and productive capacities, again, has answers that in that quote we read from page 108. He further illustrates the how in all of this on page 107. When people want more of a commodity, their competitive bidding raises its prices. Sorry, raises its price. This increases the profits of the producers who make that product. This stimulates them to increase their production. It leads others to stop making some of the products they previously made and turn to making the product that offers them the better return. In this case, uh, personal protective equipment over the past year during COVID is something where there was, a, there was a spike in demand. And because there was a spike in the demand curve, the relative price of that good that, that could be fetched at the market increased significantly without any increase, in, without any effective increase in the cost of the good, which means that there's much greater prob- profitability which means that the way that you thus increase the supply of that good and make sure that everybody has enough PPE is to raise the price. The price is a tool in this case. It's a way of, of indicating where, cons- where consumers are willing to spend their money, and it's a way of indicating where producers should be investing their scarce resources. Uh, so what winds up happening is because we have a price system, we're able to resolve a temporary shortage of personal protective equipment very quickly and very efficiently. And in a way where, where everybody wins, because we wouldn't pay, pay that money for the uh, uh, personal protective equipment unless we wanted it, unless we really wanted it that bad, unless we valued the thing more than the money we were exchanging for it, which of course is Smith's lesson. Uh, it, Hazlitt does mention that prices are not determined by cost of goods sold. We kind of touch up on that. Uh, Hazlitt mentions this on page uh, 106. This process is the origin of the belief that prices are determined by the cost of production. The doctrine stated in this form is not true. Prices are determined by supply and demand, and demand is determined by how intensely people want a commodity and what they have to offer in exchange for it. So the only place where price really ma- matters is in determining profit, which comes from the, uh, the, which comes from the price that the good might fetch in the market. So it comes from prices in its origin, not from the cost of goods sold. The only place where cost of goods sold really is a, is a, is a binary marker here is when the cost of, to, produce or, to produce a good or service exceeds the actual mar- the value that it would fetch in the market, you'll see the thing completely disappear. This is true of, of stagecoaches. Uh, the horse and buggy and the advent of the automobile. Once the once there was no way to make uh, cathode ray tubes, once there was no way to make cathode ray tubes in which, uh, in a manner which they would drive any profit, you saw the cathode ray tubes go away. Uh, you go, saw them go the way of the dinosaur. They No one's making cathode ray tube t- televisions anymore. Instead, we're getting, for what is in real terms, a much lower price, a much better product. Everybody wins. Um the last thing I want to touch up on in this chapter is he, he brings up the illustration of the Desert Island Thought Experiment. So this again, this chapter is just a primer for prices, so we're not really going to focus too much on, on everything that's, that's said in this chapter, but on the main concepts. So this is kind of, bit of where the analysis turns into a bit of a review. I really like the fact that he's introduced the, the Desert Island Thought Experiment, and I've, I've tried to use this uh, Desert Island case for uh, when I explain to people how economics works, because it's just a way of simplifying um, a lot of the lessons that can be gleaned from what we know about uh, economics. Um, and for, and for, uh, and for example, he mentions uh, the notion of delayed gratification and savings on 104. This is actually the primary or origin of actual wealth. Uh, and the Desert Island thought, ex- thought experiment, so if you think of economics from the, case of a th- from the perspective of a Desert Island, it helps to simplify these core concepts. So we ha- everybody's heard the parable of the fish. If you give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. If you teach a man a fish, he'll f- eat for a lifetime. Now there's actually a second lesson in that parable of fish that we'll get into probably in another chapter. But the point is <clears throat> that you can either... Um, you can either go around picking up crayfish and you know scrounging around uh, the shore and eating whatever f- comes to you. Now it takes basically all day to do that. But what if you said, you know what, I can live without food for like a day or two, and in that day or two, I'm going to f- refocus my efforts towards uh, building a, a you know a, tr- uh, a lobster pot, a trap, or a fishing rod and reel and hook or whatever. And it's going to take a day or two to do that. Well, the other guy on the other side of the island, you know, he's he's eating. 
He's not like actually starving. And man, his stomach doesn't hurt nearly as bad as yours does. But you fashioned that fishing rod. And in this case, now that I've fashioned that fishing rod, I can catch 10 fish a day. In this case, I've delayed the gratification. I've saved up scarce resources, if you will. Excuse me. And as a result, I can catch 10 fish a day and eat to a point where I'm fat um, on this island now and not have to spend nearly as much time scrounging around the, the shores of the beach in order to get just barely get through the day. Where the, as the other guy now is just barely getting through the day. Of course, he might get jealous and say, well, you should share your fish with me. Uh, in a market economy, the guy would say, well, you know what? I, I really stink at fishing at, at collecting firewood. So how about I trade you fish while you specialize? Smith's lesson taken again, uh, while you specialize in doing nothing but, but collecting wood. And then I, I'll give you three of my 10 fish, which is three times as much food as you had before in exchange for you get providing me all of my firewood. Um, so in this case, everybody wins. Um, when you have a distributive system, of course, and we'll get into this probably in further reads, if you just simply take the fish and give to the, to the guy who is just scra scraping around, if you just have some governmental body, if you will, some invading horde, come and take the three fish and give it to the other guy. In that case, the other guy hasn't produced the lumber. In this case, the guy who went out fishing only has seven fish for his efforts and doesn't have the lumber. So in this case, the, the sum total of product output doesn't change, which actually leads to the second lesson from the parable of the fish. If you give a man a fish, he has no reason to go get more fish. He has the fish. So if you just give him the fish, what rationale does he have to bother with the fishing pole? What rationale does he have to say, man, if I don't make that fishing pole, I got to go get that fish rather than having it handed to me, right? So that's the second lesson in the parable of the fish. Uh, Hazlitt does touch up on comparative advantage, which is uh, when what, kind of what we mentioned here with um, the guy who's catching all the fish might actually be better at, at harvesting firewood than the other guy. But in this case, the guy who's catching the fish has a fishing rod and he knows how to use the fishing rod and fishing reel. And he's so much better than the other guy at doing the fishing that one guy does nothing but harvest firewood and the other guy does nothing but catch fish with his fishing reel, with his fishing rod. And the total product output winds up being greater than if they tried to split it up any other way. Um, that's actually kind of going beyond uh, what we're going to read in this chapter, in this book, which is, again, supposed to be a bit of an introduction to economics. So if you're interested in comparative advantage, I uh, recommend checking, checking into that um, because we're really not going to get into great detail on comparative advantage in at least this series. So um, that has been our conclusion on uh, Henry Hazlitt's uh, chapter 15. Um, and we will continue on in this read, in our next read in this series, with chapter 16, which is government price fixing. Oh, excuse me, that's chapter 17. So let me go to chapter 16, which is stabilizing commodities. So until then, this has been Mike, signing off.